machines of you and me Machines of you and me We're all made of DNA We're all made of the same chemical DNA We're all made of DNA Hi there, and welcome to the 17th episode of Discovering New Advances, or DNA, a podcast that keeps you up to date about the scientific world in an easy-to-understand language. So whether you're a student in middle school or grandparent, you'll easily be able to follow along. I'm Kieran. On this episode, I will give an introduction lesson about chromosome microarray analysis, also known as CMA for short. The following episodes will either keep you updated on genetic advances in the scientific world, teach more lessons on genetics, or feature a debate about a controversial bioethical issue our society is facing today. So if you're already familiar with the basics of chromosome microarray analysis, you can skip to the following episodes about news on the genetic advances happening today and how it is affecting our world. For more information, please visit dnapodcast.com or email in at info at dnapodcast.com. So on this episode, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to learn about chromosome microarray analysis, known as CMA. So this is one of the main cytogenetic and analytic methods. Chromosome microarray analysis is a novel method of analyzing chromosomes for many genetic disorders. It's different from other types of cytogenetic tests. CMA can detect genetic abnormalities for all 46 chromosomes in one single test. So in this way, it is much more sensitive than karyotypes and also more efficient and uses computers a little more uh, efficiently and to a higher power. So for those that don't remember, Karyotyping is a way of visually organizing chromosomes so that cytogenesis can more easily identify if the individual is healthy that they're doing the karyotype for. If they're not healthy, they may be able to identify what genetic disorder the individual has, such as trisomy 21, commonly known as Down syndrome. Uh, genomic errors for disorders detected by karyotyping can be identified more efficiently through CMA. CMA can identify even more than karyotyping can as it can detect small changes in DNA that is not visible for cytogeneticists to see in a karyotype. Karyotype is, you kind of lay out all the chromosomes, but if there's, you know, a couple minor changes, you're not going to see it physically because it might look the same. The chromosomes might look the same physically, but they contain a little bit different information. So karyotyping can only identify large changes in DNA, where CMA can identify very small, minute changes. The most common use for chromosome microarray analysis is used for prenatal testing. And during this test, a gene chip called a microarray, that's where that comes from, uh, has hundreds of tiny dots consisting of DNA from known locations on each of the 46 chromosomes. So what happens is that the fetus's DNA is collected and compared to the mother's. So this comparison is a major part of chromosome microarray analysis. The test identifies if there are any changes compared to the mother's. So these changes include extra or missing DNA. The, so to reiterate, if there are changes, the fetus is most likely affected by some sort of genetic disorder. And then from there, they can look further into it. So it's kind of like a starting point to identify genetic disorders. So there are two types of prenatal testing using microarrays. Comparative genomic hybridization, also known as CGH, and SNP arrays. So let's start with comparative genomic hybridization. Comparative genomic hybridization is a quick, efficient method to compare two genome DNA samples, two genomic DNA samples. So comparative genomic hybridization has advantages over karyotyping, which was previously mentioned, and also has advantages over fish analysis, which was discussed in the last episode. So fish analysis, for those that don't recall, stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. Fish also detects chromosomal abnormalities, just like comparative genomic hybridization does. And the reason I'm mentioning karyotyping and fish is because they, unlike comparative genomic hybridization, are limited by the re resolution of the microscope used in their analysis. Comparative genomic hybridization also does not require cultured cells, which saves a lot of time as cytogeneticists do not have to wait for the sample to grow large to test. You know how they're like, oh, you know, we'll wait, got to put it in the lab and, you know, culture it and everything, you know, if you get a swab to test for strep or something like that. An interesting tidbit, comparative genomic hybridization was initially used to compare healthy tissue to cancerous tumors and compare the DNA to identify differences between the two. So just like we are talking about for the prenatal uses, we would compare the fetus's DNA to the mother's. This is comparing healthy tissue to cancerous tumors DNA and seeing where the differences are and trying to figure out 
how to cure cancer. So comparative genomic hybridization, however, is not better in every aspect um, over fish and karyotyping, but it is able to detect um, an unbalance of chromosome abnormalities a little, little more efficiently, and it can detect much smaller um, bits of it. So the other type of prenatal testing that I mentioned is SNP arrays, and these are utilized to detect polymorphisms between the mother and the fetus. So SNP arrays help identify the differences between the mother and the fetus. So let's backtrack a bit and define SNP. So SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a variation that occurs when one nucleotide, again, those are A, T, C, and G, uh, so when one nucleotide differs in a specific sequence of DNA between individuals or paired chromosomes. Therefore, SNP arrays help uh, identify these SNPs between the mother and the child and, again, finding differences. Um, these are very, very specific because if, you know, a couple letters off, it can make a huge difference in proteins and the way the body functions and lots of vital important things for life. So CMA is not only used for prenatal testing, but also tests on infants and children. It is considered to be a first tier test in the genetic evaluation of infants and children with unexplained intellectual disabilities, congenital abnormalities, or autism spectrum disorders. So once again, thrown quite a bit of information at you. So let's review a little bit of what we learned. So CMA stands for chromosome microarray analysis, and it's a novel method of analyzing chromosomes for many genetic disorders. And it does so by using a microarray chip that has, um, you know, hundreds of dots on it, and it contains small bits of DNA, and it uses that to test for all kinds of different genetic diseases and to see if the DNA is um, not normal. And it has a few advantages over karyotyping and fish because it can identify very minute changes in the DNA, which the other two uh, cytogenetic analysis um, cannot. Um, and it's commonly used for prenatal testing. And again, a lot of this is comparing DNA um, from one thing to another and seeing what the differences are. So for prenatal testing, you are comparing a mother's DNA to a child's D to the fetus's DNA. And there are two major types of prenatal testing using microarrays. One is comparative genomic hybridization and the other is the SNP arrays. Well, thanks for listening. I hope the lesson helped you out a little bit. You can further your education by visiting dnapodcast.com for more episodes. And this lesson, along with others, not only in audio format, but in a written format with visual aids to help you out a little bit more. There's also a contact form on there for easy access to send in feedback about the shows or any questions you might have. You can email us directly if that's easier for you. Uh, that's info at dnapodcast.com. If you're as obsessed with social media as I am, you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, both at slash DNA podcast. Subscribing to us on iTunes is a great way to keep up with the show. It will let you know when new episodes are out and automatically download them for you. That way you don't have to keep checking back with the site. Uh, so all you have to do is search DNA Podcast and we pop right up. If you have iTunes open, you might as well give us a review. Uh, that's the best way to have our podcast viewed by more people. And that way more people can benefit from it just like yourself. You can find all the links I just mentioned, Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, and RSS feed on the website dnapodcast.com. Thanks for listening and join me next episode to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics.